Okay, welcome back to Natural Language Processing. The next topic for today is going to be part of speech tagging. Part of speech tagging is one of the most fundamental applications of statistics to natural language processing. Let's define first what the POS or part of speech task is. So here's an example. We have a sentence that I just got from the news yesterday. Bahrainis vote in second round of parliamentary election. We have eight words and each of those words needs to be associated with a part of speech. So what are the parts of speech? Those are things like nouns and verbs and prepositions and articles. Here's another example from the famous poem The Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll from Alice Through the Looking Glass in 1872. Uh, you may have seen this uh, poem before. It's really funny. It uh, includes a lot of nonsensical words. So let me uh, read a few words from it. Twas brillig and the slidy toves did gyre and jimbo in the wave. As you can see, this is a uh, lot of uh, th those words are not real words, and yet we can figure out most of their parts of speech. So, for example, the word gyre, G Y R E, uh, is very likely a verb because it follows a did. And then, uh, by analogy, the word gimbo or jimbo is also a verb. The word wave is most likely a noun because it follows the word the. So as you can see, we can get a lot of morphological and part of speech information from the words, even if they're not real words. Another example is the word tovs. If that is a noun, we know that the S indicates plural. If it's a verb, we know that it indicates third person. And in fact, this uh, set of two words at the end of the first sentence is actually uh, ambiguous. So slightly tovs can mean uh, an adjective followed by a noun, but it can also mean a noun followed by a verb. Each of those makes sense, and it would be difficult to figure out which one it is without any additional context or information. What about the word mimsy? Well, mimsy has two reasons to be classified as an adjective. First is its ending, which is consistent with many other adjectives, but it also follows the word all, which also indicates that this could be an adjective. And finally, the word borgos is clearly a noun because it follows the word the. So what are the parts of speech that are used in English? Well, they belong to two different categories. Uh, one is the so-called open class. Those are classes where you can add new words anytime and things that correspond to new words. So you can have uh, nouns, non-modal verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. And you can also have closed class parts of speech, for example, prepositions, modal verbs, conjunctions, particles, determiners, and pronouns. It's very difficult to invent new instances of those, although it is possible in some cases, for example, there's a recent use of the word Z as a gender neutral pronoun. So for the purpose of this class, we're going to use the so-called pen tree bank tag set. Here are some examples of tags that are used there. The first example is a coordinating conjunction word like and, it's labeled as a CC. The second category is cardinal numbers, for example, one or 17, which is labeled as CD then determiner, existential there, foreign word, and so on. Typically, the first two characters are used to denote the part of speech. So for example, JJ is an adjective. And the third and additional characters, if they exist, are used to give some additional information about that part of speech. So for example, JJ stands for adjective, but JJR is a comparative adjective, for example, greener. And JJS is a superlative adjective, for example, greenest. Similarly, NN stands for uh, the simplest type of noun, a singular noun, like table. NNS stands for plural noun, so something that ends with S typically, like tables. NNP stands for proper singular noun, such as John. And finally, NNPS stands for plural proper noun, such as Vikings. So the next slide has a few more pantry bank tag set examples. So for example, RB is used for an adverb. VB is used for a base form of the verb. Some of the other interesting forms for verbs are VBD for past tense of the verb. That's not necessarily a, an ED form. So for example, irregular verbs like take uh, have a, a forms like took as their past tense, which would nevertheless be labeled as VBD. VBG is a gerund or present participle, typically an ING form. VBN is the past participle. So it's normally an ED form, just like VBD, but for irregular verbs like take, it's a specific word like taken. And finally, we have VBP, which is used for the non-third person uh, singular present, like take. 
Uh, one other interesting observation is that all the propositions are labeled with the label in, in, as you can see on the previous slide, except for the proposition to, which gets its own label because it's often used as a particle uh, in the cases like to go. So don't be confused by this fact. In, the label in does not indicate just the proposition in. It indicates any proposition except for the proposition to. And the tag to is only used for the proposition to even when it's used as a particle. It's a little confusing, but there are good reasons why the people who developed the pen tree bank tag set did it this way. Let's now make some observations. W words in English are often ambiguous. So for example, the word count can be a noun uh, and can also be a verb. 11% of all the types in the bound corpus are ambiguous. However, those also tend to be the most frequent words. So if you look at the number of tokens instead of the number of types, it turns out that the whole 40% of all tokens in the bound corpus are ambiguous. So here's some examples from uh, the pen tree bound corpus. The word like can have as many as five different tags, ADP, verb, a ADJ, ADV, and a noun. The word present can be tagged as an adjective, a noun, a verb, and an adverb. So some more examples. Here's some words that are very ambiguous in English, uh, but not as obviously as the previous one. So for example, the first word here, if you look at it for the first time, you may think of it as a non-ambiguous word. However, it can not only be part of two different parts of speech, noun and verb, but it can also be pro pronounced differently. So you can say transport as a verb or a transport. And this interesting property applies to the other words in the sequence. So you can say, I object to something, and then you can say, I retrieve the object from the room. You can discount something, and you can get a discount. And you can address somebody, and you can live at a certain address. Another similar example is the word content, which can be an adjective or a noun and have different meanings in both cases. So it turns out that having the part of speech is important also for pronunciation purposes. So for example, in French, uh, many words can be pronounced differently depending on their part of speech, even if the spelling is exactly the same. So here are three examples. The first one is spelled E-S-T, but in French it can be two different words. The, one of them is the uh, third person singular of the verb to be, in which case this word is pronounced just E or it can be the word for east, in which case it's pronounced as est. So in one case, the verb is pronounced one way, and the other case, the noun is pronounced in a different way. The second example is the word président, which means president, if it's a noun, and it's pronounced, as I said, président, but it can also be a verb, in which case it's pronounced as préside. The ENT is silent, and it corresponds to the third person plural of the verb présider or to preside. And the final example here is a word like fis, which can be uh, pronounced differently. Uh, as I said, fis, which means son, or as fi, just fi, if it means the plural of the word fi, which is string. So in this case, it's the additional morphological information about this noun, whether it's singular or plural, that tells us how to pronounce it. The three main techniques for part of speech tagging, which we're going to look at in the next slides. The first one is the rule-based uh, technique. The second one is based on machine learning, specifically tools like conditional random fields, uh, hidden Markov models, or maximum entropy Markov models. And the third one is something called the transformation-based learning. All those methods are valid and used in real-life part of speech tagging. However, machine learning methods and transformation-based methods are more powerful than rule-based because it's much more easier, much easier to scale them to other languages and to other domains because they are trained automatically. Part of speech tagging is very important because it applies to parsing, translation, text-to-speech, word sense disambiguation, and so on. Pretty much all the major uh, components of a natural language processing system depend on proper part of speech tagging. Let's look now at an example. Bethlehem Steel Corporation hammered by higher costs. So in this case, the word costs is labeled as a, a noun plural, NNS. Compare this with Bethlehem Steel Corporation hammered by higher costs, where cost is labeled as a verb. So, given that both of those tags are valid interpretations of the word costs, how do we know which one to pick in this sentence to complete its a part of speech assignments? Well, obviously the first example is correct, the second one is incorrect, but how does a part of speech system really know this information? 
So one possible approach is just to use baseline probabilities. Look at the number of times that costs appears in the training data and see how many times that word has been labeled as a noun and see how many times it has been labeled as a verb and pick the one that is more frequent. So this would be essentially a unigram part of speech tagger. Another possibility is to consider the word before. So for example, what is the probability that costs is going to be a noun given that the previous word is the word higher? And what's the probability that costs is a verb given that the previous word is the word higher? Well, clearly in this case, it's more likely that uh, the first interpretation is valid because after an adjective, we're more likely to see a noun than a verb which actually leads me to another model that can be used in this example. Instead of looking at the previous and the current word, we can look at the part of speech of the previous word and the current word. So we can just say that we're going to pick whatever interpretation of costs is consistent with the fact that the previous word is an adjective, no matter what adjective we're looking at. So the three examples that I gave you are first a unigram model, second one is a biogram model that looks at words, and the third one is a biogram model that looks at the current word and the part of speech of the previous word. Now obviously to get the part of speech of the previous word, you have to label the words in sequence starting left to right. If you want to consider the part of speech of the word after the current word, then you would need to do this from the right hand side going left. So what sources of information can you use to label words? So in the example here, the knowledge about individual words is useful. So the fact that costs is a noun or a verb. Uh, you can look at lexical information, what information is available in the dictionary about that word. You can look at the spelling. So for example, words that end in OR are likely to be nouns, like let's say the word suitor or vector and so on. Whereas words that end in EST are more likely to be superlative forms of adjectives. You can also look at capitalization. So things like IBM or capital letters is most likely to be an organization or a product and not, let's say, an adjective or a common noun. You can also use the knowledge about the neighboring words. As in the examples that I just mentioned, you can look at the previous word, the word after, maybe the two previous words or the previous word and the part of speech of the word before and so on. Okay, now before we introduce the specific techniques for part of speech tagging, let's decide first how we're going to evaluate their performance. Well, it turns out that evaluating part of speech tagging is very straightforward. However, uh, there's uh, a problem with the high baseline. The high baseline comes from the fact that we can tag each word with its most likely tag and tag each other vocabulary word as a noun. This baseline alone gives us a 90% accuracy in predicting the part of speech of the next word. So any uh, automatic system that we come up with will have to be significantly higher than 90% uh, to be useful. So the current accuracy of the best part of speech target is around 97% for English. And this is just slightly below the upper bound expected from human performance, which is about 98%. It turns out that in 2% of the cases, humans don't agree with each other. And most of the time this happens when an adjective is used as a noun, for example, in a noun-noun compound. For example, the word college senior is two consecutive nouns. In other cases, the first word in a noun phrase can, in a noun-noun compound can be an adjective that is used as a noun or a noun that is used as an adjective. For example, uh, senior class, the word senior can be used as a noun or as an adjective and humans don't necessarily agree which part of speech it is. Okay, now let's talk about the first type of part of speech tagging, the so-called rule-based method. So it is typically done by using a set of finite state automata, specifically finite state transducers, to find all the possible parts of speech for a given sequence of word, and then use disambiguation rules that make some of those transitions possible compared to others. So for example, we can have a rule that says that an article can never be followed by verbs. Every time we see a transition from an article to a verb in the machine, we're going to remove it from the possible set of outputs. So we can define hundreds of constraints like this manually and then call them in the finite state transducers. So here's an example from a paper that I worked on many years ago for French part of speech tagging. So we have here a sequence of words on the left hand side, uh, la teneur moyenne en uranium des rivières bien que délicate à calculer, uh, which stands for the average content of uranium in the rivers, even though difficult to compute. Uh, we want to tag the sentence. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we have to find all the possible parts of speech that are associated with each of those words. So we put those in the second column. 
So S as the beginning of a sentence is marked with a special symbol caret, which indicates beginning of sentence. The word la can be many different things. In French, it can be a pronoun, it can be a noun, and so on. The next word, teneur, is interesting. It's a noun in both cases, but it can mean different things, whether it's in feminine or in masculine. In this example, it is in feminine, so the correct tag here would be NFS. The next word, moyenne, can be either an adjective or a noun or a verb, and the verb can be either first or second or third person, and so on and so forth. So we have a sequence of parts of speech, and now we have to get rid of some of those. And as I said before, the sequence article verb is not allowed, and so on. Let's look at some specific examples. So here we can have a rule that says that a third person subject personal pronoun cannot be followed by a first person indirect personal pronoun. So if the example is il nous faut, which stands for we need, the word il has the tag uh, for third person singular personal pronoun, and the word nous has several possible tags, some of which are uh, first person indirect personal pronouns and some of which are direct personal pronouns. And we can get rid of the ones that combine BS3 with BI1. So that removes one of the alternatives for the tags of nu and keeps the other four. Here's another example of a constraint, n followed by k, n stands for noun, k stands for interrogative pronoun. So for example, in the sentence le fleuve qui, the river that, we want to label the second word qui as a relative pronoun, not as an interrogative pronoun. Uh, so we want to get rid of the K tag and use the alternative E as the only acceptable choice. And finally, the example that I gave you before, article cannot be followed by a verb. So for example, in the sentence uh, that consists, contains the words l'appel, the word appel can only be a verb, but the word L can be either an article or personal pronoun. So this rule here, RV, helps us get rid of one of those and eliminate the article therefore unambiguously determining that the word L is a pronoun. So this is just a small set of examples from a large system that had hundreds of roles. And you can imagine, looking at those examples, that it's very difficult to build systems. You need a lot of linguists to be involved. Very often they don't necessarily agree with each other, and the whole process can be very time-consuming. So rule-based systems have their uh, purpose and can sometimes be very useful, especially for unseen languages. Uh, but uh, most of the time, part of speech tagging these days is done using completely automated methods, such as HMMs and transformation-based learning methods. So we're going to look at some more examples of part of speech tagging in the next few slides.